I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue Is, we're traveling with Vice President Kamala Harris. If there's a national ban, look out, California. Our exclusive sit down. I San Jose. From her fight for reproductive freedoms tour. You gotta trust women. We discussed the likely presidential rematch with Donald Trump. You know what dictators do? They jail journalists. A possible border funding deal with Republicans. There absolutely can be a deal. And we get personal, talking about her mom, her 49ers, and her Las Vegas surprise for her husband, Doug. We just drove up to the sphere, and he's like, really? Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. This is the official plane of the Vice President, Air Force Two, and we're hitching a ride on the way to San Jose. The vice presidential motorcade arriving at LAX after a night at her Brentwood home. As she exits the car, she waves hello to us. The vice president traveling with her husband, second gentleman Doug Emhoff, my photographer Sam Dubin and myself, the only reporters invited on the plane. After a 50 minute flight, we touch down at San Jose Mineta International Airport where the VP is greeted by both of California's senators, Alex Padilla and LaFonza Butler. We then head to San Jose's Mexican Heritage Plaza. We are riding in the vice president's motorcade right now. It's pretty easy to go. The freeway completely shut down for her. Vice President Kamala Harris. This is the California stop of her national fight for reproductive freedoms tour. In 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court allowed states to restrict abortion rights with help from three justices appointed by then-President Donald Trump. Since that ruling, more than two dozen states have restricted or banned abortion access. Abortion remains legal and protected in California. California is among 20 states expanding protections. You'll give me the time cues. Harris meeting up with us backstage for an exclusive interview. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Madam Vice President. Alex, Welcome back to The Issue Is. It's good to be back with you. It is so good to see you, and Thank congratulations you. on all your success. Thank you. One day at a time. Uh, so let's talk about the stakes, yeah. because that's what this is all about, right? Um, and if somehow Donald Trump was able to win and Republicans take control again, what does that mean for women when it comes to abortion rights? Paint me a picture of what that looks like. Well, let's talk about what it looks like today and right now. Um, after the highest court in our land, took a constitutional right that had been recognized from the women of America with that Dobbs decision, overturning Roe v. Wade. We have seen in states across our country laws being proposed and passed that criminalize doctors and nurses, some that literally provide for life in prison, mm. um, that punish women, that make no exception even for women who are the survivors of rape or, or incest, and, and depriving them of the right to make a decision about what happens to their body next. Uh, women who, you know, I know you have an older audience, I think, so I'm gonna say something I wouldn't necessarily say around children, but women are giving, uh, having miscarriages in toilets, Alex. Mm. I've met women who were denied emergency care during a miscarriage because the doctors were so afraid that they might be held criminally liable for giving her health care. And this is happening to so many women. There was a report recently that tens of thousands of women in our country are pregnant as a result of a rape. Mm. And if they live in a, in a state with a ban, God help them in terms of their ability to get care. I think about it in terms of the fact that a majority of women who receive abortion care are mothers. So God help her that she has paid family leave affordable child care if she has to go to another state, extra savings for a plane or a train or a bus ticket or a hotel room. And the bottom line on this issue is that I do believe most people agree that you don't have to abandon your faith or deeply held beliefs to agree the government should not be telling her what to do with her body. If she chooses, she'll consult with her, her priest, her pastor, her rabbi, her imam, but not the government telling her what to do. It's just, it, it's such a fundamental freedom that is being taken and has been taken from the people of America, from the women of America. Are, are you concerned 
that a national abortion ban is really on the table. And obviously that would really impact people here in California who right now feel like their rights are protected, but a national abortion ban would supersede that. You are absolutely right, which is why I say to my fellow Californians, understand that California right now is protecting these, these rights and, has, and thanks to the California voters and, and others have put in place laws that protect these fundamental rights. But if there's a national ban, which there are many, uh, in particular on the Republican side, sadly, of, of elected leaders who have said that they, that is their full intention for a national ban. If there's a national ban, look out California. So, you know, no one should consider themselves to be disassociated with the issue because they may be living in a state like California because the issue could very well come knocking on California's door. Could some of the danger though in potentially getting rid of the filibuster, which I know is something you support, is that Republicans could use that to pass a national ban? Listen, I think the bottom line is this. On certain issues, we just shouldn't be playing politics with people's lives. Hmm. And is not agreed to. anyone who, who feels strongly about this issue for themselves or their family, I respect that. But don't tell other people what to do. You, you gotta trust women. You gotta trust women to be able to know what's in their own best interest. It, having to make a very difficult decision and weighing all of the, 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 the issues that are in their life that they mm -hmm. know might affect them. But we have to trust women. I, I, I just think about the idea that a bunch of legislators in a state capital are sitting around with their flag pins deciding that they're in a better position to make decisions about her body than she is. Mm -hmm. There's something just very offensive about that, not to mention very harmful in terms of what these bans have meant. And this is one of the big issues you guys are running on now. Yeah. Um, do you assume Donald Trump's gonna be the nominee? Listen, I think that after New Hampshire, you know, the writing is pretty clear. We'll see. That's obviously I'm not voting in that primary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if that, if that is indeed the election, you have talked about him as a potential existential threat for the country. Do you think that the country can survive a second Trump presidency? Listen, the, the former president has made very clear he admires dictators and has said he'll be a dictator on day one. You know what dictators do? They jail journalists. Dictators try to undo free and fair elections. Uh, dictators decide that the rule of law, unless it applies in a way that is helpful to their political interests, may be abolished or overlooked. So we have to listen to him and take him at his word. Um, we are looking at a former president who has openly said he would weaponize the Department of Justice, who has said that he will exact revenge on his political enemies. I really feel very strongly that we each as Americans are going to have to really dig deep to ask ourselves, what kind of country do we want to live in? But I think that that's as much as anything what's at stake. What kind of country? To that point, though, how did we get here? Because I remember covering your inauguration, and it was a bleak moment. We had just height of the pandemic. We had just height of the pandemic. We had yeah. just had an insurrection. Yeah. We had just had an impeachment. Yeah. Uh, and Donald Trump essentially left in shame. And now he's the Republican front runner, and there's millions and millions of people uh, that support him and love him. Why do you think that is? And as you trying to think of the electoral strategy, how do you deal with that? Well. First of all, I look at what happened in the midterms and what happened in the most recent elections, right, in the last couple of years, including at the end of last year. In so-called red states and blue states, when the issue of freedoms was on the ballot, in particular access to reproductive freedoms, whether it was California to, to Kansas to Ohio to Virginia, mm -hmm. the people voted in favor of freedom. And I do believe that is at the core of who we are as Americans. We believe in freedom. We believe in the right of each individual to have freedoms to just be and to and love who they love openly with pride, the freedom to make decisions about their own body, the freedom to have access to the ballot box. And I do have faith that the American people want to live in a democracy 
They want to know that their leaders have respect for the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think that's what's going to carry the day. But it is an existential moment, which is, are we prepared to understand that we are very much at an inflection point? And it's going to be the choice each of us have a right to make about what kind of country we want to live in. Um, you were put in charge of analyzing some of the root causes of in some of the immigration things, yeah. or not the borders are, which I think is a misconception. Yeah. Um, but there's a border deal potentially being negotiated right mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. The former president is saying, don't go for it. Is it possible to get a deal done in this environment? I do believe that there, can, there absolutely can be a deal if people are willing to put politics and partisan politics aside. And do you think they are? And deal with the problem. Because here's the thing on this issue. We all know that our immigration system is broken. It has been for a long time. On day one, when right after our inauguration, when President Biden and I came in, first bill we offered was to clean up the immigration system and create a pathway for citizenship. They've not taken it up. Because sadly, there are a lot of members of the Republican Party who elected members of the Republican Party who would prefer to run on the problem instead of fixing the problem. We're offering solutions, including offering that and asking for $14 billion to, to, to put at the border to address some of these problems. If there was a real desire to fix it, the solutions are at hand. And I think back to the days of a, of a President Bush, a John McCain. You know, there was a time, when, I mean, even Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan former passed? Go yes, passed. yes. Where the Republican yeah. Party understood we have to work together on some basic issues like fixing our immigration system. Mm -hmm. And it can't be about partisan politics. You know, so it is my hope and desire that people who are in a position to fix it actually participate in the solution. Up next, the vice president gets personal. What her mom would think of this moment. We have some fun with her Super Bowl predictions. I want to talk about you for a moment. You know, we've been talking for a long time and I know how much your mom means to you. Yeah. And I'm sure when you come home to California, yeah. do you think more about her? I do. And, and do you think about yeah, what she would think of you in this moment? All the nice things people say about you, all the mean things people say about you. What do you think? That's so funny you bring that up because I, I've been home for the last couple of days and um, running into a lot of people that knew my mother. And um, with great stories because my mother was just so passionate about so many issues. She cared, I mean, women's health. She lived her life to raise her two daughters and, and breast cancer. She was a breast cancer researcher. Um, and I think, you know, if my mother were alive today, she would want us all to be doing what we were doing just here in San Jose. Let's build community. Let's all get together. Let's build coalition, understanding we have so much more in common than what separates us. Fight for the people who, who need to be seen and heard. Um, she would be saying, you know, that this is ridiculous that some people think their strength is based on who they beat down when true strength is based on who you lift up, you know? And I'm sure she would probably be frustrated with some of the things people say about you. What do you think is the biggest misconception out there? Um, I, you know what, let me just tell you this. I, I do believe that when I look at an audience like the hundreds of people here in San Jose who know my work as you know, elected and then re-elected district attorney of San Francisco, by the way, the first woman ever, mm -hmm. elected and re-elected as attorney general of California where I ran the second largest Department of Justice in the United States, second only to the United States Department of Justice, and I happen to be the first ever woman. Um, when I was the United States Senator representing one out of eight Americans, the people who know my work um, are incredibly supportive, understanding that the work I do now as Vice President is, is uh, the foundation of that work is years and years of working on issues like the climate crisis, what we need to do to address women's health issues, what we need to do to build our economy, what we need to do to fight against you know, greed and corruption. Um, so I feel good about it. 
I remember interviewing you as an intern when you were San Francisco DA. Uh -huh. uh, this was how long ago, back in 2007. Uh -huh. And now to see you as vice president, uh -huh. the vice president of the United States, is it still surreal for you sometimes? And is there a particular moment that was the most surreal where you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here? There have been many. There have really been many. I mean, listen, it's, uh, there've only been, I'm the 49th. Yeah. So think about that. There have only been in the history of, of America 48 people who have had this job. And they looked a little different. And they looked a little different. <laughs> yeah. But only 48 people. So it's not like there's any training program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And, um, and so to have the honor um, of being in this position, I, I, I take it on with a profound sense of duty to do as much as I can every day that is about uplifting the condition and the well-being and the, and the prosperity of the American people. I take it very seriously. Uh, as a Californian, mm -hmm. as a Bay Area girl, yeah. San Francisco 49ers in the, in the Super Bowl. <laughs> yes. Talk to us about your day watching that game. Were you cooking for it? What, what I went through was your cooking. mind as you're watching it? Walk us through your, your I, NFC Championship experience. Well, I had, uh, by, the day started with a, a, a few calls with my staff and then with the president. We had a few meetings. But um, I actually made a big pot of bolognese. Nice. <laughs> And the kids came over. Doug was very happy. We watched the game. Well, actually, there were two games right. on Sunday, and um, and it was a really great. It was a great Sunday. My favorite. My favorite day of the week, if I can have the luxury of of, of it being what I want, is Sunday family dinner, and I cook, and it's friends, it's family. So this past Sunday was that day. It was really great. Are you confident in the Niners? Yes. Oh yeah, we're gonna win. <laughs> oh, we're going to win. Does the gentleman agree with you? I'm not going to talk about, yes, <laughs> it's, we've had our rivalries, but I'm telling you the Niners are going to win. Yeah. And, um, and I'm looking forward to the game. And I know you just brought him to U2 uh, for the, at the Sphere. I so did. He's, he's, uh, I surprised him. He, I, you know, it's difficult to surprise my husband, but, okay, this is, you know, it's a, it's a very insignificant issue for most people, but we don't get out much. Yeah. <laughs> And so to be able to take him to a concert, because he's been going to U2 concerts since he was like a teenager. And we were in Nevada working. He had five events that day. I had five events that day in Nevada. And then he thought we were on our way home. He thought we had one more meeting. And we just drove up to the sphere. And he's like, really? And I was like, I'm not going to say. And um, and it was a great concert. They did a great job. It was great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, it's great Alex. to have a Californian thank in you. the job. It's good to be here. It means a lot to, to have this conversation thank you. with you. I appreciate you. Madam thank Vice you. Madam Vice President, thanks thank for Thank you, Alex. When we come back, one-on-one -on -one with the senior senator from California, Alex Padilla. We are joined now by the senator from California, Alex Padilla. Great to see you. Good well, to see you again. Welcome yes. back to the issue is. San Jose, not Los Angeles. I know. Good to be together. It's good to be here. So uh, let's talk about the state of abortion rights. What is your message to women that are scared right now when it comes to abortion rights? Message to women, uh, if you're in California, know that it is enshrined in California's constitution. You have access here uh, in the state of California, but we can't take it lightly, the threats uh, of a national ban is alive and well. We have to engage. If you're uh, eligible to vote, make sure you're registered, make sure you're making your plan to vote, not just in the upcoming primary, but in November, especially and help spread the word. Um, let's also talk about what's happening right now when it comes to immigration. There's a real fight uh, within the Republican caucus on how to go forward. Not everything's out yet in terms of specific text as we'd have this conversation. What are you hearing and what do you want to see? I think Democrats uh, unanimously agree that we can can and should improve the situation at the border, uh, keeping it safe, keeping it secure, keeping it humane. Uh, and the current numbers of people coming to the United States seeking asylum, there's got to be a better way to handle it. There's thoughtful solutions, but that's not what I'm hearing Republicans are asking for. They want to go back to the Donald Trump era of border policy, which not only doesn't work, it makes the problem worse. Uh, you know, there's n Republicans that will never be happy unless we shut down the border completely, not a single person uh, else coming in. It's one thing to talk about asylum seekers, and we should. Let's think about who it is that's coming. People from Cuba, Venezuela fleeing authoritarian regimes, but also the economy. Mm -hmm. Mexico is our number one trading partner. 
when Governor Abbott in Texas tried to shut down the border in Texas and insisted that every single vehicle be inspected, that cost their economy millions mm -hmm. per day because of delays in goods being moved. So there's a smart balance to be achieved. Yes, safe, secure, but also humane. But you would admit that there is a crisis at the border right now. Look, it depends on how, how you define it. You know, when Too people many say, people coming in out of control. Uh, the, the numbers are up because the uh, agents are doing their job. Yeah. There are people who are being identified, being detained, and whether they're paroled in uh, or requesting amnesty, which is legal. Uh, yeah. But the volume is up. I acknowledge that the numbers are much more, uh, are a lot higher than they have been historically. So the question is, how do we better handle that? It doesn't help when the prior administration gutted the departments and agencies of personnel and the capacity to deal with migrants. Um, we are here at this event for Vice President Kamala Harris. You're helping to introduce her. You greeted her when she got off the plane. What does it mean to have a vice president from California? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. To have the vice president who's intimately familiar with California and our values uh, seated right next to the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, and being the last person in the room when the major decisions are being made, a special eye out for California's needs, whether it's climate, response to uh, disasters, protecting a woman's right to choose, uh, knowing that immigrants contribute to the economy and our nation's security, they're not a liability. Uh, it, it's everything. Thank you very much. Great to talk with you. And since we've featured your son on the show recently, happy birthday to your son, <laughs> yes, Diego. Diego just number nine. nine. Hi, Diego. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. Thank Great you. to see you. Watch more of our conversation with Senator Padilla at youtube.com slash Alex Michelson. We'll be right back. To listen to extended interviews in podcast form, search for The Issue Is wherever you stream your podcasts. Thanks for watching a very special edition of The Issue Is. We'll see you next week.